Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is the very optimistic. He is a real kegs half full guy. He is the captain. Like I always say, if you can't beat them, why try? It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Brick Kiln, bourbon barrel aged by the absolute geniuses working very hard over Jackie O's Brewery in beautiful Athens, Ohio. This is a barley wine and you got to check it out because we gave it a big five out of five bottle caps on the old garage grading scale. And they didn't even send us any. Well, this is an absolute gem and was brought to us by the following first up. Ben in Pittsburgh and his daughter in Circleville, Ohio. And a big shout out to Elizabeth in Orlando, Florida. Next up, we have Shane from South Jordan, Utah. And a big cheers, mates, to Pamela down under in Australia. Cheers, mates. And we also have Jacqueline in Dallas, Texas. And last but not least, we have Leslie in Burleson, Texas. Thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on that donate button. And make sure you follow us on social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, all that stuff, at True Crime Garage. And that is enough of the beers, Nia. All right, kitties, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Well, Captain, yesterday we presented the case of 19-year-old Todd Schultz and 18-year-old Annette Cooper, a young couple that is murdered in a small town in 1982 in Logan, Ohio. Now, one thing we also talked about, a little bit about, was a man named Kevin Meyer, who was reported by his employers to the police. The butcher. Yeah, and said, hey, These kids were butchered. This guy, Kevin Meyer, he's a weirdo. He works for us, and he's a butcher. We think he had something to do with the murders of those two teenagers. But what we talked the most about was a guy named Dale Johnston, the stepfather of Annette. And the local rumors at the time was that he was molesting or had molested Annette Cooper at some point, Mm -hmm. and that he was either jealous of her relationship with Todd Schultz and killed the couple out of jealousy, or he was trying to cover up the molestation of his stepdaughter. Well, and let's not forget that there was a media circus in this town that's only 6,500 big. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point in the investigation, Dale Johnston starts telling investigators, as well as the media, about Annette being involved with an older man before she died. And public speculation stirs as to who this could have been. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, this turns out to be an officer of the law, Lieutenant Mowry. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, he quickly becomes under suspicion. This is because of his alleged romp with Annette just weeks before her disappearance. So she was dating Todd, but the rumor is that she had sexual relationships with this cop. Yeah, there's some there's some kind of rumor to this. And I think on the surface, it looks like Dale Johnston's just kind of pointing out a possibility. Like, I couldn't be the killer because guess what? She was involved with somebody else and you've not spoke to that guy yet. Right. What's weird about this is that when it first comes out, it looks just like Dale Johnston presenting another option, mm. taking suspicion off of himself. Where it holds a little bit of water is the people in town start talking and they name a name, Lieutenant Mowry. Right. And I do continue to say alleged because I couldn't find any actual proof that the two of them had a relationship. Well, and this gets tricky because in such a small town, the rumor mill works fast and it's kind (laughs) of like the game of telephone. So all you have to do is, and, and maybe the stepfather knew this, maybe he knew all you had to do was put out the rumor and that rumor would grow and grow and grow. So that rumor could have been started by, the allegations. I love small towns, Captain. I always have, always will. But 
But the thing that I've always said about small towns is what's really great about this small town is everybody knows everybody. What's really bad about this small town is everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like you just said, if there's rumors about me or you, everybody in the town has heard them. If you or I got any business going on, everybody knows our business. There's plenty of rumors about us on the internet. Well, here's the other weird thing regarding this Lieutenant Mowry, and if they actually had any kind of relationship or if he had any involvement in their disappearance and murder. Right. So listen to this. We have two witnesses that come forward, and this is a father and son that come forward. They say that they saw someone matching Lieutenant Mowry's description emerging from the cornfield in which the bodies were later found Mm. on the early morning of October 5th. So the morning after the young couple were last seen. Now we also have this ongoing situation. We have Jill and Dan Frey who continue reporting that Kevin Meyer is the person they should be looking at that authorities should be looking at. And they have some new and interesting tidbits to report to police. This time, they are telling police that Dan Fry intentionally got Kevin Meyer drunk. And during the course of that evening, Kevin Meyer, he had said undisclosed, unreported information concerning the double homicide to Dan Fry. And they report this to police. So do we know what this information is? No. And I'll tell you why. Several reasons. One, as soon as this report comes out, Mm -hmm. Kevin Meyer quits his job. (laughs) About time. I don't know how much of this was trickling down to the media. I don't know how much of this was behind the scenes. Right. Or we also have to keep in mind, if, if it was making its way to the media, Kevin Meyer may not have known at the time that the accusations were coming from his employers. Right. And, And also, this is a very small town. I mean, I worked... Uh, at a lumber yard one time and probably 90% of the employees were from Logan and they had to drive about an hour and a half to get to work. So there's not really job. There's not even to this day. There's not a lot of jobs there. Right. And it it is great little town, but Kevin could have been going, I don't care who the rumors are coming from. I need a job. Not only does he quit his job, but he also leaves the town of Logan moving Mm -hmm. away and he hires an attorney. And he moves away, even though he's still considered a suspect at this time. Right. Now, That's a little fishy. The victims uh, were eventually buried in separate cemeteries. And during both burials, there was heavy media coverage. And then a public Halloween party is held in downtown Logan to help boost the spirits of the Logan citizens. Mm-hmm. And Lieutenant Mowry is promoted to captain. Then we have trick or treat night is set for daylight hours due to the murders. You know, nobody wants to send their kids out after dark or as the sun is setting when we still have a murderer on the loose. Hocking County seals Annette and Todd's autopsy reports. This is to keep them from the media. While the media reports more public opinion of devil worshipers killing the teens. Right. And then there were rumors of cattle mutilations dating back all the way to the 1970s. And a lot of people suspected that the cattle mutilations of the 70s were connected to the double murders of 1982. Yeah, and they're probably more connected to quaaludes. Well, (laughs) then we have Annette's biological father, Ben Cooper. He makes the spotlight by giving interviews and blaming the murders on Dale Johnston. Sheriff Jones brings in a psychic. This is Shirley Saunders. Now, wait, so we have two. This is what's a little strange about this case. Okay. Mm -hmm. First off, we have a man, Dale Johnson, who's considered to be an outsider, considered to be different than the people of Logan. And when he has nobody else to turn to, who does he turn to? He turns to a psychic. I mean, if you're already the guy that's labeled as different right. in a small town, you don't go, well, I found one person to support me. And it's this guy that says he's a psychic. Mm-hmm. That seems a weird thing, but that backfires on him because his psychic friend then tells Dale Johnson and the media, look, I think you killed them. Uh, right. and, and I'm taking the police's side here. Now we have the sheriff himself bringing in their own psychic. This is, 
this is going to sound very strange, but I tried and I spent a lot, maybe way too much time on this one aspect of this case. This individual, Shirley Saunders, and it's kind of a common name, so that does not help Mm -hmm. when I was trying to research this, but a couple of the things that I found, Captain, she's labeled as a FBI psychic. Like Mm. she either is employed or contracted by the FBI to go into these areas and give psychic readings or, or tell us her, her insights. We know that there has been mediums and stuff that have worked for law enforcement before. And then on top of that, we know that a lot of detectives will use psychics, not necessarily that they have to believe in them, but just that sometimes by getting a reading, they're getting a outside perspective Mm -hmm. of possibly where they could look, especially if a case goes cold. Well, and I couldn't believe that the FBI would would employ a psychic or somebody to be in that, hold that title of mm-hmm. psychic as a job title for the FBI as a full-time employee. I wouldn't be shocked if they're contracted on occasion, but I couldn't find any information on this Shirley Saunders. I was hoping maybe she went on to write a book or something where her, her credentials would be outright stated. Other right. than this could this could just be public opinion where somebody stated this wrong. And again, certain aspects of this case have become local legend and folklore. Well, maybe they reported it wrong. Maybe she works for the FPI. Right. The or, Federal Psychic Institution. Well, and maybe she's brought in from out of town and people had already seen the FBI coming in from out of town and thought well, she must be FBI. Right. Well, she reports. She came in with her crystal ball. Yeah. Everybody's like, shit, must be the FBI. Well, she reports to Sheriff Jones. Now, Sheriff Jones is the one that brought her there. And she reports to Jones that Dale Johnston is innocent in her mind and mm-hmm. that the murders were committed by two killers and not one. Well, just let the cat, let him go. Well, this is not going to sway the sheriff. He, he still believes that Dale is the killer and his team of investigators gather more damaging reports of Dale. A lot of these, they're starting to get stories of Dale owning a large amount of knives and guns. And we know that they were shot. We know that the victims were dismembered. Um, so this does not look good for him. Now we have 31 year old Mike Jividen. He alleges that Dale Johnston is a, is a Satanist or at least involved in satanic activity. Right. He doesn't base this off of anything. Well, I can't say that he doesn't base it. I don't know what he's basing this off of a dream, but he's, he He doesn't dream. He doesn't put forth any concrete evidence to, to back up this statement. This, Mm -hmm. this again, we just have another person that lives in the area coming forward with information that we have no way of, deciphering if it's true or false. Right. And again, with this town being so small, the rumor mill is going to just keep going and keep going. Then we have another individual and I'm going to totally screw up his name. I I can't figure this one out. 25 year old Scott Fugit, I think Fugit. I'll spell it. Fugit. If anybody wants to look this up. Sounds great. F U G E T T. I'm Mm -hmm. probably getting that completely wrong, but so this 25 year old man named Scott, he reports that Dale Johnston fired shots at him when he rode his motorcycle on Dale's property. Mm -hmm. Uh, This again, not looking good for Dale at a town meeting. This is a town meeting of 250 citizens. They are vocally outraged about the killer not being apprehended and the lack of police officers in Logan. So this would fully point out the fears of the citizens of Logan at that time. Not only are they saying, Hey, we're afraid because you haven't arrested anybody, Mm -hmm. but we're also afraid because we don't think there's enough law enforcement in this area. But we know that they, we know that they were getting help from the Columbus PD unofficially. Right. And, and maybe Sheriff Jones didn't want that quote unquote help. Mm -hmm. Now the meeting ended with the citizens of Logan demanding the arrest and conviction of the major suspect who they considered to be the major suspect, Dale Johnston, regardless of conflicting views and regardless of the lack of evidence. And we've seen this in Ohio before up North with old Dr. Shepard, right? The, the, you know, the, public outrage 
And so then it's weird how public outrage actually gets the criminal justice system moving. Yeah, it, it's the, the public uh, controlling the hand of the law or the media directing the hand of the law. Well, the sheriff's department shows up at Dale Johnston's property. This is unannounced. So he's butt naked. Well, what I will say in his defense here, one thing that points good for him in his direction, they show up unannounced and Dale says, go ahead and search the property. He's, he's willing to let them. He doesn't fight it. You know, Mm -hmm. he doesn't say, no, you need to come back with a warrant. Um, they don't specify by the state of circumstantial evidence, but they, what they state is that circumstantial evidence was retrieved from the edge of the property that links the stepfather to the actual murders. Mm. All right, let's talk about this here, captain, because we have no list of what this circumstantial evidence is. It doesn't exist, Mm -hmm. but I like, I, I think this is where you have the sheriff's department going, Look, we did a search and we found some stuff. Yeah, we found some shit, boys. Okay, so the the citizens have pushed our hand. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to release this information conveniently to the media, which is again going. It's going to keep the cycle going. It's going to keep the circle going. Right? Mm-hmm. You wanted us to find evidence. We found it. Well, then we have a statement that's very interesting, and this is where I think we can come up with an idea of what that circumstantial evidence may or may not be. We have FBI ballistics expert. This is Thomas Nicholson. He reports publicly that Dale Johnston quote, might have committed the murders. All right. Well, what is this guy's job? He's a ballistics ex- ex- expert, right? Mm-hmm. That's tough. <laughs> That's tough to say. He's a well, we also have this guy earlier that says, Hey, I was riding my motorcycle on Dale Johnson's property, and he fired a couple shots at me. Mm -hmm. My idea here is that maybe they recovered bullet casings from somewhere. Right, right. And these bullets could have been twenty-two caliber. Right, and it could have been on on the edge of the property because he was shooting at a guy to get off his land. Or somebody not Dale Johnston was shooting their gun on the edge of his property. Mm -hmm. Dale Johnson's property is, depending on which report you read, it varies from 52 acres to 54 acres. Mm-hmm. I, bel- I I labeled it as 53 just to be consistent. Right. <laughs> so very clever. Dude, 53 acre property. Mm-hmm. You can't you don't know what the hell's going on on your property. That's a huge amount of land. Anybody could be on the edge of your property firing a gun right. at any time. Now, let's say it did come from let's say it was from Daryl Dale Johnston target shooting, shooting, hunting animals, mm-hmm. or shooting at this motor, this motorcyclist. Yeah, or he could be going out there, you know, with his dong flapping in the wind, and he's just firing bullets up in the air, you know. And he, I think... He has the right to. It's his land. But a twenty two is an extremely, extremely common gun. Yes. Um, and to the point where that's you have the FBI ballistics expert, Thomas Nicholson, stating... Johnston might have committed the murders and he's basing that I I believe off of them finding casings of 20 of 22 caliber bullets on the property at some point also seems like they haven't done the test yet because the test would prove if it was that gun or not well that's why I think he had to publicly say might right because I bet you they did do the test and they didn't match Hmm. but because they were the same caliber of gun He's saying, well, he had access to a 22. We can't prove that they're the sa- it came from the same gun. Right. But maybe they couldn't prove that they didn't come from the same gun. Mm-hmm. Therefore, he might have the the thing that the reason why I include these tidbits though, captain, is all of this stuff is finding its way to the media. There's mm-hmm. nothing that happens in this case that doesn't get released publicly. I mean, they they did lock up the autopsies. They did seal the autopsies, but outside of that, any little inkling anybody had of Dale Johnston being guilty finds its way to the newspapers. Right. Which is very interesting to me because in Ohio, we have another set of murders that people have been talking about a lot is the Pike County murders. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a very, very small town and there's not, there's not much happening in the media about that case. No. So it's kind of the reverse. 
Now, we also have Dr. Luis Robbins, a forensic anthropologist, reports that Dale Johnston's boot matches the print found at the crime scene. And then we have 19-year-old Steve Rhine. This is Todd Schultz's cousin. He comes forward as a possible eyewitness. Later, he is hypnotized by police. And, well, not by an actual police officer, but I'm sure they mm-hmm. hired somebody to hypnotize this individual. And during this interview, he says that he saw Dale Johnston force the two teens into a car on the evening of October 4th. So now we have eyewitness. We have an eyewitness that vocal that, that names David Johnston right. or Dale Johnston. Now, Dale is interrogated. He's, a, he's picked up for this. He's interrogated mm-hmm. in what is later reported as a smoke-filled room for seven to eight hours. During this, and I don't think this was by choice, Captain, during this, he's wearing nothing but undershorts and socks. He's feeling good. Well, they basically tell him to strip down. He wants to get in his element. And they're going to interview him in his undershorts and socks. And the reason they did this they were convinced that they would find some kind of markings on him, right, right. scrapes, bruises, something that, that would have been defensive wounds. There was no there's no sign of trauma to his body at all. Mm. He, well, well, there's signs of trauma to my body. He continues to deny the allegations against him. Agent, remember Agent Henry from the FBI, he mm. disapproves. He publicly comes out and disapproves of the way that Detective Thompson interrogated Dale Johnston. He called it barbaric. Right, but he he has his suspect in his sights. Right. Right. So, I mean, this is a classic example of people getting tunnel vision and not jumping on board. During this interrogation, uh, the Logan police detective constantly, he just kept telling Johnston to confess. We know that you killed the kids. You know that you killed the kids. You need to confess. You need to make this right. Um Make it easier on yourself. And he kept in he kept reminding him that the town was in fear. The whole town was in fear. Can you help us out by confessing to this so that the town can continue to go on? And he said, Hold on a second, let me take off my socks. Well, they also brought in Sarah, his wife, mm-hmm. and they brought in his other stepdaughter, Michelle. Michelle was reportedly kept in a room for eight hours for a solid eight hours. And what I mean by that is during that eight hours, she had nothing to eat. She had no restroom breaks. Mm -hmm. And according to Sarah, her mother, she said that they just grilled and grilled and grilled Michelle until she finally just shut down. Uh, She just wouldn't respond to anything. Right. And like, that's what we're talking about um, the other day on off the record is, you know, if you're if you don't have any information or they're accusing you of a crime and you claim that you're innocent, how many times should you have to claim this before they're forced to leave you alone? And I'm curious as to her age. We I know that she was not an adult. I believe that she would have been 15 or 16 at mm-hmm. this time. Now, what her mother, Sarah, would later tell us is that the police, the sheriff's department, they were angry they, that they couldn't get anything out of Michelle. They got nothing out of her. Out of eight hours of grilling her, she confessed to nothing. Right. And Sarah says that what they wanted her to say was that she was there, that she had witnessed the, the two being killed or saw them after they were killed, and yeah. that the mother, Sarah, had cut up the bodies or helped her husband, Dale, cut up the bodies. Yeah, it's, and if you have no evidence of this, and you, they must have believed that this is how it went down to try to get this teenager to turn on her mother. I mean, it's one thing to turn on your stepfather, especially with the rumors around town, but to turn on your mother as well. That makes me really question if Dale's guilty or not. I almost feel like this poor girl that's grilled for eight hours, it could have been easy to turn on your stepfather. Especially right. if there was actually any kind of molestation or, or sexual abuse going on in the household. If, how long would it take you to tell him, hey, yeah, I do think he did it. Maybe I didn't see anything, but I still think he did it, you know? Right. So it makes me question his guilt, but 
He's arrested. Dale Johnston is arrested. He's denied bail. The same day that he is arrested, Michelle, the other daughter, is picked up and placed in foster care. This is in another county. They take her out of the area. And we have the the wife that remains, Sarah. She is basically ostracized in town. Right. They she married a murderer. Because she married a murderer and now they don't and they think maybe she's involved. So they take her daughter away. The townspeople seem to think that she is involved and maybe the police just don't have anything on her. In the course of weeks, man. This woman, Sarah, lost her daughter to, to being murdered, mm-hmm. her husband to the arrest of that murder, mm-hmm. and her daughter to foster care. Yeah, everybody, if you're driving to work or home from work, make sure when you get to your destination that you treat yourself. Well, Captain, as the trial for Dale Johnston neared Sarah Johnston, she continues to be harassed by police and the public. She was let go from her job at a doctor's office. She was a receptionist there. Her car insurance was canceled. This is the... Right. This is the lengths that, that this news spread to. Yeah. The people that insured her car for her to drive canceled her car insurance. They said, we don't want you as a customer. We don't want your money. Yeah. We will no longer insure you as a driver. Um, if she went into a store, she was told to leave. Mm. So again, being ostracized by the entire town. That's awful. And then she starts having panic attacks. We pointed out before the break all that she lost in a short period of time. She starts having severe panic attacks. If she's secluded for so long, that could become, you can get a lot of social anxiety from being secluded. At some point, she's sent off for treatment because she decided in a haze of probably severe depression. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's keep in mind, let's, let's forget that her husband's been locked up. Let's keep in mind, her daughter's been murdered. Right. Regardless of who did it, her daughter has been killed at the young age of 18 years old. And her other daughter was taken from her, taken from her home. She's not allowed to see. She's lost both of her children. I think the key thing here is the reason that you wouldn't feel sorry for her is if you think she's involved. But there is zero evidence of her being involved. Well, like I said, in in, in what can only be assumed in a moment of severe depression, she decides that the town, the prosecutor, the police, the sheriff, the judges, people in power, the mayor, she, she decided that these people must have conspired against her and that they may have killed her daughter and arrested her husband and taken away her other daughter. She makes up a list of people that are in power in the town of Logan, and she intends to kill people that are on that list. She actually came up with a plan that there was there was a, a place and a location that most of these individuals were going to be at the same time, and she was trying to figure out a way to plant a bomb at that location. Mm. Now, she is kind of so far gone by this point she starts to tell people of these homicidal tendencies and thoughts that she's having yeah. and thank God for that. That's, that's something we have said a billion times over and over on this show. If you are thinking things that you think are strange, right. Tell somebody, tell Please. somebody yeah. because yeah. you, you can get help and you can't look if she would have planted that bomb or figured out a way to do so, we would have a whole nother story to tell here. Right. And then, yes, I'm sure it'd make a great episode But all jokes aside, if you do feel like you're having thoughts that are are not normal, the first step that you can do is to talk to somebody that you trust. And it might take a lot of power and effort, but say to them, I think I need a little help. And sometimes by releasing that, 
uh, to a loved one that they can come around and they can give you the help that you need. She eventually is sent away for treatment. And I believe that this treatment lasted eight or nine months. And a lot of it, I'm assuming captain was probably a good amount of grief counseling, uh, which would have been much needed for her to set her back on the right path. So good for her and good for the people that helped her. And mind you, not only is there no evidence, but there's not even hearsay evidence. The only thing they, that they had was the idea that they were trying to get the daughter to, to make up some story that, that she was there and that she, uh, conspired in this murder. Well, regarding Dale's trial, he opts for a three judge panel instead of a jury trial. I think this is a smart move on his behalf. He also requests for a change of venue, which normally I think would be granted seeing how there's been so much rumor and accusation amongst the citizens of Logan, as well as the media coverage that surrounded this story. However, this change of venue is denied. Also denied were his motions to find and present the idea that the death penalty is unconstitutional because they were going to sentence him to death if they found him guilty. Now, the trial begins as a fist fight on the courthouse steps between relatives of the friends. I'm sorry, between relatives and friends of both victims. Hmm. And the reason why Who this, won? this is an interesting thing here, because you don't typically have this in a lot of murder trials. Both of the victims here, their families and friends are made up of people that are, that are also on one side, friends and family of somebody being accused of the double homicide. Right. This fist fight breaks out. The, Fisticuffs. The, the police, the sheriff, they're having a hard time kind of keeping law and order and organization here. The, the courtroom and the hallways were standing room only. We also have dozens of citizens out front of the courthouse picketing each day that the trial went on, and they're picketing for a conviction of Dale Johnston. They're screaming, get her done. When opening arguments commence, uh, there is, to say the least, heavy media coverage and armed security in and outside of the courtroom. The three judges, along with the prosecutor, defense witnesses, and Dale, they all go to the Johnston farm and to the riverbank and to the cornfield area, a little field trips, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And this is so that everybody can see the areas in question. The defense presents a valid perspective regarding the weakness of the state's case while showing multiple suspects that who could have equally been as guilty as Dale Johnston. The defense also presents the theory that Satanists killed the victims. The judges permitted testimony from a specific witness, and this is key to this trial. This is the witness, Steve Rhine. We've talked about him already. Now, to go a little bit more in depth with him, the first time that Steve Rhine was interviewed by sheriff's deputies, he was not sure of the day that he was quoting. He was not sure who the kids were that he saw when he later referred to the teenagers that went missing and were murdered, or who the person was with the kids that he saw. So really he knew nothing. He was also captain on paper. This is on in the police report. He's also not sure of the kind of vehicle that he saw. Basically what he says is he comes forward to the police, to the sheriff's deputies and say, I have some information that might help the case. This is before the arrest was made. Right. He says, I saw two people with some guy getting into a car and I'm not really sure what day it was on, but it was in that cornfield where you found those kids. Right. Well, the sheriff's department, that's when they decide to hypnotize him because sometimes you can hypnotize somebody and draw details out of what they can't seem to remember. All right. So we have get out your crystal ball already in this case. And then on top of that, get out your pocket watch and you're getting sleepy, very sleepy. Well, what happens here, Captain, is that Steve Ryan, who would eventually testify at Dale Johnston's trial Mm -hmm. and which led to the arrest of Dale Johnston, after he spoke to Detective Thompson several times and was hypnotized, now all of a sudden he is telling in his statement, his latest statement is, I saw Annette Cooper and Todd Schultz, who eventually were murdered, 
forced into a vehicle and it was Dale Johnston that forced him into Dale Johnston's vehicle in that area on the day that they went missing. Well, you know what this is, right? This is a Halloween miracle. That's right. Well, this is going to lead to Dale Johnston being convicted and sentenced to death. He is going to appeal this and he's actually lucky. I believe that he got the death penalty. Now keep in mind, this is Ohio back in the early eighties. So he's sentenced to sit on the electric chair. Yeah. These appeals will eventually grant him a new trial. And this is because the prosecutor and investigators, it becomes known that they withheld statements and evidence from Johnston's defense team that could have cast major doubt on his guilt and that they failed. This is the investigators failed to pursue leads that could have helped to exonerate him. And what that means is investigators, when they took tips, when that phone was ringing off the hook, they were listening to the ones that said, Hey, I saw Dale Johnston do something, right? They weren't really working the leads that said, Hey, I saw something else going on and it didn't include Dale Johnston. Right. Like I've said before, it's, it's classic tunnel vision. Well, it was determined at a new trial captain that Johnston should have been found not guilty based on the withheld evidence, which included eyewitness testimony that placed other individuals at the cornfield and not Johnston, as well as the testimony that was ultimately ruled that should not have been allowed at trial since it was only brought about by hypnosis. So eventually Johnston is freed in 1990. Now, he would go after the state for a wrongful imprisonment claim in 1993. This is denied by the state. And technically, (laughs) well, it's denied on multiple occasions. And technically, to kind of sum it up best that I can, Johnston still to this day has not received a cent from the state for the years that he spent not only in prison, but on death row. And why I find it so hilarious It'd be like giving me the power where I could punch you. And then I say, well, I know I punched you, but you can't sue me. Well, and the thing, too, is that there was language that was put into law at a later date that basically says people like Dale Johnston, while technically, as it's written, somebody that's wrongfully convicted can and should be rewarded money by the state. However, they've put language into that, that it's, they make it damn near impossible right. that you're going to get paid for anything. And the sad part of this to me, and we still got a bunch to get through is that, but before Dale Johnston was sentenced to death in 1984, mm-hmm. he had a wife, he had kids, he owned 53 acres of land. He had no debt. He had no pants on, but when he was released, he was released as a free man and it, he had nothing yeah. other than an old pickup truck that was given to him by his lawyer. Look, if you're going to take the the right away to be sued, if you put the wrong person in prison, then you need to spend more time trying to put the right person in prison. Amen. I also want to point out too, we talked about his wife, Sarah, going and seeking treatment because she was had fallen on hard times to say the very least they would end up getting a divorce. And I think this should point out to whom I believe the real Dale Johnston to be. They got a divorce because of him. He had nobody. He's on death row. He had nobody. And he told his wife who it seems like he loved very much. Right. He said to her, he said, Sarah, we need to get a divorce because I'm locked up. I'm the monster that they locked up. The monster that they think I am, they locked me away. But right. you're on the outside and everybody thinks you are a monster and you've been ostracized from town and everybody hates you and you having my last name and you being married to me is going to destroy the rest of your life. He says to her, I would much rather have a friend that I got a divorce yeah. from than to have a wife that ends up committing suicide. And that was the path she was on. Yeah. Yeah. And even once he was released, she continued as well as her daughter, Michelle, the living daughter, they continued to support Dale Johnston all of this time through all of his appeals and through uh, his release. They were there to greet him. We should point out too. remember Michelle, who was taken from her mother's home, placed into the foster care system in a different county. 
when she was 15 or 16 years old. And the day that she turned 18 and was released from foster care, where did she go? Back home. Right back to her mother. Right back to her mother. And that, again, kind of points out that maybe some of these rumors weren't true. Maybe they just were not true. Well, Johnston, after he's released and he's broke and he has no land, nothing, he does go to live with his mother in the village of Asheville, Pickaway County, which is 20 miles south of Columbus. Yeah. Um, he said that he still was receiving quite a bit of prejudice from the people of that area. And he decided that Asheville was not going to be where he stayed. He was still very much under a cloud of suspicion, you know, and that even the people that didn't believe that he was guilty of murder, they still thought and still suspected him of molesting his stepdaughter before her death. He would eventually try to move on with his life. Uh, while in prison, he did commit himself and his life to Jesus. And after his release, he actually became a head usher at the First Baptist Church in Grove City, Ohio. And later, a member of the congregation, this is Roberta Crocker, she took a liking to the head usher. She said in an article, quote, he was a handsome dude. <laughs> so in 1998... If I um, ever get married again, I hope she says, hey... He's one handsome dude. I, I would just love to be described as a handsome dude. I strive to be a handsome dude. I want to make dude. a shirt with your face on it that says handsome dude. Well, I'll give you the short of it, Captain. Uh, Roberta and Johnston's relationship grew serious over the years. Eventually, they were married uh, in June of 2000, and they lived in a home in Grove City, Ohio. This was not without Roberta's son's blessing, who is Brian Corbett which was the pastor at the First Baptist Church. He had heard the rumors and even heard Johnston talking about uh, spending time at Lucasville, which everybody in Ohio knows, hey, Lucasville's not just a prison. It's maximum security. And, right. oh, yeah, there's death row there, too. Yeah. So he did a lot, spent a lot of time with Dale Johnston getting to know him before he gave his blessing for the, the marriage to his mother. The strange thing here, though, Captain, is after he's released, after Johnson's release, this technically becomes a cold case. Yeah. And people would still speculate as to Johnson's guilt. A, a person that refuses to, there's an evil person that continues to haunt True Crime Garage. And his name is William Wickline. Yeah. He has been considered a suspect in this case by the public for many years once this became a cold case. And he is William the Butcher Wickline is his nickname. He's an animal. He was found guilty of murdering, decapitating, and dismembering Chris and Peggy Lurch. And he was free at the time of Annette Cooper and Todd Schultz's murder. Yeah. And so he was long suspected of this case. He has been executed by the state of Ohio. So good luck investigating that at the time. Yeah. If you haven't looked up Wickline, you should because he is, I mean, he is a scary monster. You could, if you wanted to write a, a, a murder book or a mystery book, right. you could you could look up his life and base uh, a criminal or a murderer after him and have a, have a good selling book. Now, out of nowhere, Captain, there is a break in the long cold case. This didn't come until June of 2007. This is when a woman, Sandy Linscott, she is visiting her probation officer and they're talking through some things. And she says to her probation officer, I think that 25 years ago that those two people that were murdered, Todd and Annette, I think they were at my house the night that they disappeared. Mm. And I think that they left with my husband and a man that she, she didn't know his name. She described the man as looking like a chipmunk. Okay. Okay. So you want to be described as a handsome dude and not a chipmunk. Right. Note to self. Well, her husband is Kenny Linscott. We've heard that name before, haven't we? Mm -hmm. He was the man in the corn stalks that were watching the police when they found the bodies. Yeah. And they questioned Kenny Linscott. The one day. with the cut. And she says when her husband Kenny came home that he was covered in blood and he had a bad cut to his arm, but he refused to discuss what had happened. Investigators very quickly zeroed in on Kenny Linscott. And then they also zeroed in on the man that looked like a chipmunk. And this was Chester McKnight, who was in prison for possession of child pornography and attempting to arrange sex 
with an under, undercover officer posing as a teenage girl. Real winner. Now, Lynn Scott, Kenny Lynn Scott told investigators that there was a chance, a small chance, that the murdered couple had been at his house that night and that he might have even been in the cornfield with them that night, but he said he did not kill them. <laughs> okay. But what happens is once they zero in on this McKnight guy that's in prison already, he very quickly says, I killed them and Lynn Scott helped me. Really? Yeah. So do you want to hear why? how this goes down? Yeah, but do we have a why? We do. And okay. this is this is what is so sad about this our show and about our world and about these stories. A lot of times it's very clear that these murders are just senseless. That there are people that are wiped off of this earth that are taken from their loved ones way too young yeah. and almost for no reason at all or reasons that don't make sense to, to good people, to good normal people. Right. This is the story that was told to police that on the evening of October 4th, 1982, Todd and Annette went to a local small time drug dealer's house. This is Kenny Linscott. The thought was that they were there to purchase a small amount of marijuana and have a couple of beers. They're just going to have a little party, a little get together. Right. They're adults. We've all been there. The drug dealer, Kenny Linscott, he had his friend at the house. This is Chester McKnight. At the time, McKnight was a drifter who was also nicknamed Chester the Molester. <laughs> well, all right. This this is really sad. The, the young couple was lured to a cornfield near Kenny Linscott's house, allegedly after more partying went down. McKnight was high on LSD and cocaine, and he told Linscott that he was planning on raping Annette. And it sounds like Kenny Linscott was into doing the same. The four of them left Linscott's house. And when they left, Linscott handed a 22 caliber revolver to Chester McKnight. And he said, if Todd Schultz puts up a fight, use this gun to control him. Well, they did start to assault Annette. And as expected, Todd Schultz came to her rescue and started to protect his girlfriend. Right. And so McKnight, McKnight shot Todd six times, twice in the head. And Annette started to scream, and that's when McKnight panicked and shot her in the head and neck. The men then grabbed a machete from Lynn Scott's garage. They stripped the bodies. Um, McKnight masturbated over the body of the female victim. <sighs> wasn't prepared for that. And Lynn Scott held the limbs while McKnight cut away at the bodies. At one point, McKnight apparently slipped badly cutting Kenny Lynn Scott's arm. The men then lugged the torsos to the riverbank and threw them into the Hocking River. Apparently, the men washed up in the river and went back to Kenny Lynn Scott's house. Afterwards, McKnight says he let the body parts lie, saying that he left the home at some point, And that at some point, Kenny Linscott must have returned to the cornfield and buried the remaining limbs. Investigators withheld a witness report that a man, not Johnston followed the couple into the cornfield and then heard gunshots and screams. That man that was reported to police back in 1982 was Kenny Linscott, but the caller didn't know Kenny Linscott's name, right? This was the lead that should have been followed up on instead of honing in on Dale Johnston. On September 2nd, 2008, McKnight and Lynn Scott were both indicted on charges of aggravated murder. McKnight demanded lethal injection to pay for his sins, but later ultimately accepted a pair of life sentences. He will die in prison. With the case against him shaky given McKnight's varying stories, so keep that in mind. McKnight was giving multiple stories and confessions. It had been a long time. You know, it had been over 20 years. Right. Lynn Scott, 48 years of age at the time, pled guilty to abuse of a corpse and was released from prison after only serving 10 months. So to put this in perspective, Dale Johnston, who killed nobody, served a longer sentence in prison for the death of his stepdaughter and her boyfriend, then Kenny Linscott, who participated 
actively and willingly participated in events that led up to the murder and led to the concealment of the murders. Right. Johnson served more time than this guy. He lost everything. And then Kenny Lynn Scott gets 10 months. And both these killers actually remained free after killing these two young people longer than the victims lived on this planet. It's a sad, sad set of circumstances. But just because there's arrest in this case, that doesn't mean there's justice. Right. There, there actually feels like there was no justice in this case. Now, Kenneth Robert Lynn Scott of Logan, Ohio, passed away on Monday, November 25th, 2013, at the age of 52. Do you have any recommended reading for us this week? You know that I do, Captain. This week we are recommending The Acid King by Jesse P. Pollock. Very, very exciting stuff, Captain. I cannot lie, though. I have not actually read this book because it just came out yesterday. But I have ordered my copy, and Jesse is a great author and a good friend of our show. We've had him on before. The Captain had him join the Captain on our other great show, Off the Record. And The Acid King is about a murder in a small town that local police in the international press dubbed a satanic sacrifice. The short of it, four teens went into the woods and only three came out. The long of it, the murder became the subject of several popular songs and TV specials addressing the issue of whether or not American teens were practicing Satanism and debating the symbolism in songs by ACDC and Ozzy Osbourne. So make sure you check out The Acid King and support our buddy, Jesse P. Pollock. And thanks to all of you for supporting The Garage. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.